Hello everyone, this is Johnny Wu here. Uh, we are finally coming back to do a live stream with all the different uh, experts that we know in the industry and uh, hopefully we're gonna enjoy having this more often and then you'll be enjoying all the stuff we have here. Today we're gonna bring back our favorite, our popular guy, good friend of mine, internet friend, Jerome Cushon. Jerome, welcome. <laughs> internet friend. Uh, yes, uh, but we have met in person. <laughs> yes, we did. We did met in person, but it's it's an inside joke that I we know. started. Um, I knew Jerome maybe over tw almost twenty years ago, right? Yeah, uh, I, it's I when you started time. the email system, I, I emailed you back and forth, but I've never met you so until uh, when you joined Clubhouse last year, and that's when we was like it's all connected. It's like, oh my god, this guy I know him for for years. Yes. And yeah. then we were at the AOF Film Festival together because you were you had your movie there. Yep. Um, and then you were there giving some lecture too. Yeah, yeah. and and I was there to uh, to uh, you know do a talk. So yeah, it was exactly. great. Great so I remember uh, last time you were here with me it was uh, January twenty second. So that's almost a year ago. And so uh, before we continue, let us have everybody know who you are. You know, introduce yourself a little bit so people know a little bit who you are and have some background. Uh, sure. Um, so let's see, my elevator story, uh, which is probably more than one sentence, is um, I, I was a distribution consultant for 15 years. Uh, I've actually been in the distribution space longer than that, but but an actual consultant where I was educating filmmakers on distribution. And I have a DVD course that I was you know, putting out in the marketplace and selling and doing a lot of consulting for filmmakers, helping them place their movies into the marketplace in as successful a way as possible, because that's that's always the big challenge. Um, and then uh, I pivoted uh, earlier this year. I launched my own distribution company. Uh, it was a long time coming, I guess. Um, and now I'm actually acquiring movies and um, strategizing with the producer to, you know, we put it in the marketplace in the best way possible, uh, whether that's with a studio uh, uh, once in a while, or whether we're going on to VOD platforms or the streaming services, you know, getting a deal with Hulu or HBO or whoever. Uh, so it's it's great. It, I love what I'm doing, and um, I watch a lot of content now. <laughs> almost probably almost a movie a day I'm reviewing for possible distribution. So uh, so that's that's me. Great, great. So um, since last time that we talked to now, how things have changed in the VOD format or distribution perspective? Um, I, you know, I don't know that things have changed that much in the past year or uh, the past 11 months. Um, VOD is still king. Um, uh, I, you know, every now and then I'll have someone who will talk to me about they want to do some kind of theatrical distribution on the movie. Um, you know, if you don't have the bottom line is theatrical still exists, of course. Um, but if you've got an indie movie, it can be very challenging to actually make money with it going into the theaters. There are instances where that does happen. Uh, and we just saw a big example of that with Terrifier 2 just this year, just this past fall in October, you know, through now. Uh, any movie that has done tremendous at the box office for, for what they made the movie with for. Um, so the VOD space is still huge. Um, there are three types of, and I don't know if you want to get into this now, Johnny. But sure, you there, can, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, are, we got an hour to kill. So. <laughs> sure. <laughs> There are basically three, three to four types, three predominant types of VOD. VOD is video on demand. So we have what we call TVOD, T-V-O-D. That's transactional video on demand. That's where people are going to Amazon to rent your movie for $3.99 or buy a digital copy for you know $10.99 or $12.99 or whatever. Then there is AVOD, uh, A. Uh, standing for ad supported video on demand, that is uh, streaming channel services like Tubi, TV, Pluto, Peacock, uh, Vudu, Roku channel, etc. Um, and then there are this obviously the, the subscription video on demand services that we all know and love. Um, S stands for subscription, so SVOD is what we we you know colloquially call it, um, and that's Netflix. Hulu, Amazon, and, you know, and some others. Uh, th there are quite a few SVOD services out there, although most of the public is only familiar with the top, the top, you know, several. Um, and then uh, I'm back to transactional, TVOD. It's not just Amazon. Vudu is, has a TVOD platform. They've had it forever. Uh, Google Play, YouTube Movies, 
iTunes. Everybody knows iTunes. So that's the big space uh, are the, the VODs. The, the, and, and also then there is premium video on demand, PVOD. Um, and that really applies to those movies that uh, that you might see offered for a higher price point. You know, $15 upon release on VOD or $30 for release on VOD right when it first comes out. Um, it, it's not as common, but we do see it from time to time on certain titles. Gotcha. So um, I'm an independent filmmaker, and you and I have worked, uh, talk about a lot about my distribution trust strategy and things like that. So for people who have not yet have an idea how to get into these opportunities, uh, we all know there's maybe what, 99.99% of, of the distributors are a little bit more sketchy in the sense that you, you had to work with a lot of their agreements and make sure that uh, it's advantage to you than to, to themselves, right? Right, right. Yeah, you know, the, the, the um, I, you know, I don't know if it's 99.9, .9, but you could be right. You know, it, it, it's high. Um, a lot of distributors, this is the big problem. It's been a problem for decades, and, it, and it's still a problem, is that many, many distributors are, um, well, first of all, a number of them are corrupt. That's that's just a given. Um, sorry, but that you got to watch out for that. Um, a number of them, a number of them, I I, I think cons they um, operate in what I don't consider a most ethical way. And here's an example of that. Let's say you get a contract from a distributor, and in the contract is the distributor's right to recoup expenses, large expenses whether that's $20,000 or $25,000 or $50,000 or $100,000. If you see contracts where they, where they list amounts they can recoup from your movie, you have to get that capped. We call it capped, capped expenses. You've got to put a limit on that. If you don't put a limit on that and that particular distributor is not ethical or dishonest, you'll never see any money. So that's one of the number one things you have to be careful for with in contracts. Those expenses need to be low and capped. Um, and you've got to close all the little loopholes that are usually in the boilerplate contracts that distributors give you. So, and there's, there's, I mean, I don't want to, you know, there's a, there's a, there's 50 loopholes that could be on those contracts. So you should have an entertainment attorney review your contract and one who understands distribution don't hire your divorce attorney in Iowa or your real estate attorney in Florida. Uh, you don't want to hire those kinds of attorneys because they don't know the ins and outs of this very particular space of distribution and its own jargon, right? Mm -hmm. it's, its own words and its own phraseology and what are standard terms and conditions and all that kind of stuff. So not to bore, not to bore you out there, but uh, you got to be careful. So, Back to your question, John. Yeah, there's a lot of so I consider something like that unethical, but it's not illegal if you sign the contract. Right, uh, right. So just just be aware. The truth is, is that today, most distributors, if you've got a movie with no names in it, most distributors are not going to put any marketing money into it. That's just the the, the unfortunate truth. And right. so if they want to recoup up to let's say twenty five k. Okay, there's a very major distributor, independent distributor out there. They have a 25K marketing expense in their contract, and it's capped at 25K. So it is capped, and you might think, oh, good, it's capped. But they don't spend that money on marketing your movie. And if you mm. try to negotiate that with them, maybe, maybe if they really want your movie, you can get them down to 20 instead of 25. I did last year on for, for a client. But they won't go lower than that. And if you want to go lower, they say, "Well, bye bye, go find someone else." And you might that 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 uh, twenty five thousand dollar cap, for example, doesn't include a marketing expense either, right? It's just part of the distribution expense cap that they're talking about. That that's true with a lot of distributors. With this particular distributor, I'm thinking of it is yeah. it is everything. But okay, but here's the thing: in in negotiation with them, you might say, "Well, look." You know, they'll say, well, we're not going to spend it unless we need to, unless we feel it's going to help the film. And it's good. And you're like, well, great. Then how about we just have that agreement say no expenses for that area 
And if you want to spend money, you just email me, ask me, and if I approve, I give you my approval in an email. Simple, right? That's no, the they won't do that. They won't yeah. do that. So you really yeah. have to sometimes you have to play hardball and negotiate. Right. Hard. So Tyler is uh, actually already asking a question, and I think you kind of responded. Uh, so we go to the second question of his. He was wondering about when you say expense cap should be low, what roughly would you expect in total for a low, no budget film? Um, all right, good question. Um, so there are there are a, a few, I don't even know, I'm like lo- literally a very few distributors out there like me who expenses are so low, you'd be like, well, that's crazy. You know, you, and so my expense cap is $2,500. It's very low. And it's only used for encoding and delivery. I use a vendor to encode and deliver the movies to the VOD platforms and the streamers. Um, every platform and streamer has different specs that they want your film to be delivered in. So someone has to do that. Um, most distributors have a vendor who does that. Um, I do. Uh, there's a couple. There's one distributor I know of who does it in house. Um, so, anyways, it, that's very low. Um, and so you want something low, you know, that's, that, I, that like mine, or I probably wouldn't want to go. And it really depends for a domestic deal, U S and Canada distribution. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sign an agreement for more than 5,000 from some distributor. I just wouldn't. Um, there's a lot of distributors out there that chart. There's one distributor out there. They, everybody, a lot of people know their name. They charge you 5,000 as in coding and delivery for all the platforms. $5,000. You know how much money they're making in profit on that? Uh, probably $3,500 in profit off of that, um, depending upon where the film goes. So that gets complicated. But Yeah, and you know, encoding for it is really not that hard. You just put in the file into the computer and it does the job for you. Yeah, yeah. So you just so you know, so these vendors, you know, they set it up, they they hit go, and then they can walk right. away or do whatever exactly on other stuff. So, um, so most of these, so this one company charges five. I, uh, uh, this other company again, I'm not using their name. They charge seventy five hundred. So they're easily making five thousand profit on that seventy five hundred. Um, so those are some of the things for Tyler. Tyler, so those are some of the things that you want to be careful. You really want to get expenses down wherever they are in the in the distributor's contract uh in any film with no names if it's not genre that is if it's a coming of age or a comedy or a drama and there's no names in it you know you're going to have a hard time making a lot of money unless you do a lot of marketing and, and and publicity yeah all right so you just mentioned about the word genre can you uh, tell the public here, or the listener, watch or, or who is watching? We have about fourteen people right now watching us, so that's actually pretty cool. Um, as- by the way, you know, when I posted this video that you did up on my on on my above uh, two the previous one, yeah, yeah, uh, I don't know what the views are. I forget what they are, but that's where a lot of people end up watching us. Oh, and then and I don't know if I've told you this, and then letting me know, hey, I, Jerome, I saw your video with the Johnny Wu, and I'm like, that's pretty cool. I did yeah. expect that, but that was pretty cool. Thank you. So yeah, so why don't you uh, break it down a little bit about the genre base, what genre sells the best, or what genre do not sell without any name actors, and then let's go into the name actors. Okay, so, so if you've got a name actor in your film, it can make money pretty much no matter what genre, whether it's a, whether it's horror, thriller, or drama or comedy or coming of age um how much it can make really depends upon the name the level of name as well as the actual genre so as i as you know johnny horror films <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> horror films um uh, you know film action horror uh vampire zombie uh anything with a lot of violence and blood those those always sell and they always make money because that's what the That's what a large part of the audience wants to see. And it also translates well internationally. It's not, it's not as dependent upon the words coming out of the actor's mouth and, and uh, the audience understanding every word that someone says, if they're in Germany or Sweden or Russia or whatever. So, um, so when you've got an, when there's a name or a couple of names, even if they're not big names, you know, maybe they're television names, or maybe they were series regulars on a, TV show in the past. I have a movie right now that I just picked up. Uh, we're working on the, they're working on the deliverables and we're working on the poster. 
It's got five actors in it who were all on a TV series or on several TV series in the past. So Gen Z will know who they are uh, because it was that age. It was that age demographic of the TV shows. So, you know, Gen Z will know who they are. Baby boomers may not, <laughs> but, you know, but it's a younger film anyway. So uh, something like that should make money. Um, it's it's a kind of a thrill. It's a thriller. It's a drama thriller. So, you know, if you're looking to make your first movie or your second movie or whatever, you know, find some actors who might be on hiatus from a TV series and get them in the movie, you know, hire them, do a low budget SAG agreement, whatever, because it really, really helps not only with getting programmed in festivals, if you want to do film festivals, mm -hmm. but it, 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 it really helps distributors go, ah, I can make money with this because listen, that's the bottom line folks. Um, distributors, most distributors are in business to make money, sell films and make money for you and them and their company. Right? So it's really important to keep that in mind. You may have made the greatest movie since, I don't know, since citizen Kane, right? <laughs> but it, it, if there's no names in it and you don't, build what I call a pedigree on it. Maybe we'll talk about that in a little while, Johnny. If you don't put it, you know, get notoriety for it, you know, the, the distributors are like, well, who cares? How am I going to make money? And there are a couple distributors who art is important to them. Um, <clears throat> but most, mostly no, mostly it's a very business oriented arena. Right, Unfortunately. right. Yeah. So we have some a uh, gentleman here, Kirk Bennett. This is a two. So he wanted to know, <coughs> excuse me, can you please give us some feedback about creating series and, and are series easy to be distributed? Uh, um, uh, creating TV series is not really my wheelhouse of skills. So I'm, I'm a little averse to wanting to give advice about that. Um, but I will answer the second question. Are series easy to distribute? Uh, the short answer is yes. It depends on your goal and what you want to achieve. So, <clears throat> excuse me again. If you want to uh, be on Hulu or Netflix or you know or one of the cablers, uh, then it really then whether your series or one of the cable channels, one of your you know it's going to be what is your series about who's in it, and that's going to determine what level of distribution you could attain for the series. And I'm and I'm speaking about if you've completed a series. Some people actually make a series, six, eight episodes, and then they want to go out and sell it to, to, one, to one of the aforementioned mm -hmm. uh, platforms or companies. So if you're, um, you know, if it's got a certain level to it, you have a greater possibility, you know, Squid Game, was made independently. Uh, it wasn't pre-funded by one of the platforms. And, you know, it was so well done that Netflix said, we want it. Um, so that can happen. If it's a very kind of, I don't know, if it's more of a reality-based series and there's nobody well-known in it, I mean, you sure, you know, you could still get on some of the VOD platforms, you know. Doesn't mean you'll get a license fee for each episode. You may, you may not. Um, so there's two ways to really skin the cat on this, getting a license deal from a streamer, a cable company, whatever, where they're paying you X amount of money per episode for an order of six, eight, 10 episodes. And then there is getting your, your series onto to TV or Amazon prime, or, you know, any of the regular VOD services. And, and that's not hard to do. Okay, so um, since so you just talk about two topics, I want to chime in a little bit also too. One yeah. is about Squid Game. It's a it was a made for Korean TV show, and Netflix saw it and loved it, and they took it over, and bought it. So one thing I realized is it's also also because the big crave right now for Korean TV shows or Korean movies. I mean, if you look at Netflix or any other um, platform right now, Korean or Asian movies are become big and popular right now like crazy. So maybe should would that be something that some someone should consider? Like if you make a movie in Asia, you have the chance to get into Netflix quicker 
or does it really matter? Or if you make a movie here, how could you make getting to Netflix quicker too? Yeah, so that you know that that's that's kind of a complicated answer for that. But, <laughs> but I will say this: it you know if you've got, um, you know if you've got a really good film that's in another language, whether it's you know Chinese or whatever Japanese or Russian or whatever you know sweet you know Danish. Um, Dutch, whatever. Um, I think I feel uh, I feel the key is what's the genre? What what is what is it about? And you know, Squid Game is a thriller, action thriller. Lots of lots of you know, it's it's a competition and there's death, lots of death, right? So you know, it, again, it's the right genre, um, and you know, the American audience is willing to watch the right genre films if it has subtitles. That's kind of key, right? When the first, when the original Girl with the Dragon Tattoo came to America, it went into theaters. And it did, if I'm not mistaken, 10 to $12 million in the theaters. Subtitles. But people went to see it. It's it's an excellent movie. And it's well, it's well done and satisfying as entertainment and people went to see it. So um, if it's not that, if it's a drama, well, you know, I mean, I mean, all we have to do is look at the examples. What are the kinds of films that come to America that are foreign language that really hit with the audience? It tends to be, you know, genre oriented films like the the one that was up for the Academy Award, you know, a couple of years ago. Right. Um, and Johnny, I'm the title slipping from my brain right now, but uh, you know, I wouldn't one, remember anything. I just used to delete them out of my brain. brain. <laughs> I see so many movies now. I'm, you know, I've, I've watched, uh, I've looked at 150 movies in the past five months. So wow. Um, so, anyways, you know, that's really key. Um, I actually have a movie. Um, I'm not going to say too much about it because. Uh, the contract hasn't been signed, but it, it would be my first foreign language film that I'm picking up. Uh, and it is in Chinese and it, it's a martial arts film. So I see potential in being able to generate revenue for the producer. It doesn't serve me or the producer if I don't think I can generate revenue to take somebody's film on because the producer will be happy because they're not making money and I, and I won't be happy. So Right, right. Um, so in that case, it's it's a genre film, uh, um, and and could could make could generate money in America, even though it's in Chinese. Right, right. So I also, yeah, I know there's also a lot of Korean movies right now, especially or TV shows, especially uh, BL related. So boys could call the boy love. It's it's more like a LGBTQ, but they call it boy love. It seems to be huge and popular all over the YouTube and all the places too. So. Um, yep. that said, I also noticed LGBTQ kind of movies doesn't do well theatrically or, or distribution wise. Is there any reason for that or just the, the, the audience is not ready for that kind of topic? No, I don't think it's that the audience isn't ready. It's, it's that many of, of these films are dramas, um, yeah, like the, the recent right now on uh, Peacock, I think it's called Bros. It's really not that bad, but it really didn't do well at all when it went to the theater. It's actually bomb. Yeah, I mean, you know, dramas again. It's 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 that the audience look. You know, the, you know, and I know you know this. The audience wants to escape. Generally speaking, the audience wants to escape their life and be taken into another world for two hours or ninety minutes, and dramas. You know, a good drama can do that, but it also can remind people of their own life <laughs> as they're watching it. So, you know, they want most people want escapist entertainment a large part of the time. Um, sometimes, no, sometimes they're willing to. They have to be in the right mood um, or to watch a documentary about a social issue or something that is, is um, you know, is important for humanity. You know, people, it's like, you know, documentaries, documentaries, the best, the most Revenue generating documentaries are the the entertaining ones, right? The the Michael Moore type or the, you know, um, 
the ones that have a point of view and, and are fun to watch. Um, if it's a serious doc, there is an audience for that, for sure. It's just, it's not the same audience. It's not the same huge audience. So uh, I think LGBTQ uh, uh, films, uh, a lot of them are dramas or coming of age. Um, if they've got a name in it, well, then it should do okay. Um, but again, why will people go to the theater versus, you know, all everything they do at home in their living room? Well, you know, you, to go to the theater, you've got to choose a screening time or, you know, with your partner, when are we going to go? Right. Get in the car, go park, get in the theater, buy your concessions, you know, sit down. I mean, it's four hours for a two yeah. hour movie. Um, and this, you know, I can just go sit down and turn on Amazon and, and watch whatever. And I don't have to spend all that extra time or that extra money. So, you know, I mean, this is a whole, you know, right. This is why movies that want to have a theatrical release, it's like, how are you going to get the butts in the seats? Right. I mean, I, I was uh, the point person for a movie that went theatrical in a very limited market uh, back in Cincinnati, in Cincinnati, your state, um, yes. back in 2016. And we opened the movie. It was not LGBTQ, but it was a faith-based drama. Opened it on two screens. Um, did a lot of marketing to that audience, to the faith-based audience. But, you know, whereas we really didn't make, we didn't make the money back doing the theatrical, but it's done well on VOD. Okay. Interesting. There's people, you know, why? You know, it was a drama with no names, even though it was faith based. It's like, well, why are people going to go to the theater to see a drama when they can choose one of 10,000 dramas right in their living room? You know, you have to give them a reason, and making it an event is important. Fathom Events makes things an event. If you do a deal, if, if you do a deal with Fathom Events, for example, you know, they're going to make an event out of it. They want to make an event out of it. Give right, you a right. reason besides just watching a movie. Yeah. So uh, Tyler just asked, uh, asking you the same question uh, that you you can't remember the name. What's oh. the name of a movie called Parasite? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, Parasite. <laughs> so Parasite, you know, is a thriller. Um, and, you know, and it was well done uh, and entertaining. So, um you know, those are the ones that really kind of hit with, at least with the American audiences, um, right. that Americans are willing to watch, you know, or Narcos on Amazon or whatever streaming platform, Narcos is, or and Netflix. It's like, you know, well, these are crime, genre, crime, whatever. People are willing to watch those with subtitles. All right. So let's talk about return of investment. Sure. As an independent filmmaker, if I want to make a movie, how much should I spend in roughly in my production to be able to actually see an investment, a return on investment within, let's say, the first three years? Well, do you mean how much you should spend making the movie, or, or exactly or how much I should spend making a movie? Because that that sometimes there's I think there's a misconception because you know when you people think make think of making a one million dollar movie and they expect to get the money back within a year. Yeah, um, I so, want you to talk a little about that part. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I would say if you're, you know, if you're a producer director and you're trying to determine what your budget level should be, um, again, two, there, there's two scenarios, one with some kind of name quality actors and, and one without. All right. So if you're, if you're doing one without no name actors, uh, you know, maybe great actors, but they're not in the union or, or they are, but you know, they don't, you know, not recognizable. Nobody, nobody knows who they are. Yeah. Keep your budget as low as possible. Um, whether that's 50,000, 30,000, 100,000, keep it low. Um, because again, if it's, if, if you're making a drama with no names and you're spending a hundred thousand, you're spending too much money. That's the bottom line. If you're making a horror zombie movie, no names, and you're spending a hundred K, you can make your money back. I still think that's a bit too high. Now, put a name, some kind of somebody from a TV series or a couple people from a TV series in there. Sorry, let me close this one little window that will make noise when messages come in. Sorry about that. Probably to tell you that you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
No, is somebody telling me what their Wordle score was today. Um, <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> uh, I like Wordle. I do it every day. It's fun. Um, so, you know, keep 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 the budget as low as possible. Now, if you're putting in uh, uh, a couple of semi name actors, people that that you know faces are recognizable, but maybe they're not household names, right? Okay, you can go higher then. And again, if it's a drama. I'd probably keep it to 100K for an indie movie, um, 150K. Uh, if you're doing a genre film, you know, then you can go higher. Um, I think it's just really important to keep the budget low. Johnny, you keep your budgets very, very low. I don't know that you want to talk about how low, but you keep them very low. And 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 that is a, what a good producer should be able to do is keep oh, thank your budget you. low. But I'm not going to talk about my how much I put my budget into it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> because they can be watching. So, <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, so it's really incumbent to keep the budget low. Now, if we're now, what kind of money can you see in a return? I mean, you know, well, all right. It depends. Um, it's all over the map. Right. Uh, if you're. You know, if you've made a good, you know, thriller. Or um, zombie movie, whatever. Um, you know, you could, and again, it depends on where it goes, what the launch point is for the movie. Are you launching on the top level VOD or are you going to, let's say, a TVOD and AVOD all at the same time? Some people do that. Um, but, you know, a good movie could make anywhere from, you know, zero dollars to tens of thousands of dollars in a given quarter on VOD. So, it, it really is all over the map what a movie can make. Um, the kind of marketing that a producer might do to support that, regardless of what the distributor does or doesn't do, if the producer or the director is putting in energy and marketing and, and you know, whether that's, you know, Facebook advertising, Instagram advertising, or just, you know, really putting the word out every day, uh, you know, a movie can do, can make money, can make decent money. Um, so. I don't know if that I I can't, I mean it's kind of an answer that could go all over the place in terms of yeah it, it's it's a little it's a very big it's it is, it's hard to understand to see how much money you can bring it back in all depending how much money you spend and uh, whether or not you have a very smart marketing uh, exposure and this and that so so and, 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 and I'll add one thing onto that sure. and that is that um, that I've I've always I've, I've taught this for years and I think it's really important that when you are um, budgeting your movie. I don't care what budget, micro budget, small budget, $10 million budget. You got $10 million and you're going to put Kate Blanchett in the movie uh, um, or, you know, you well, know, you won't get Brad Pitt probably, but, you know. You Die Hard, uh, so, Bruce Willis. <laughs> yeah, Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis. That's a good example, actually. You know, he does these not huge budget yes. films that nobody knows about. They go to VOD or they go to a cable company. They go to Netflix all the time. So, yeah, you're like, what? I never even heard of this movie and Bruce Willis is in it. Yeah. Cause yep. he, he's doing it for the paycheck. Um, so, you know, you got a film like that. Um, have some money set aside for marketing PR and marketing. What is the percentage you people set aside for that? Well, all right. So there's, there's about three different schools or more. Some say 50% of your budget should be set aside for marketing. Some say 25%. Some say whatever you got, <laughs> you know, um, I, I think 25 to 50 is a good, I mean, well, first of all, if you're making a $50,000 movie, you know, if you're talking about 50%, that's 25K for marketing. So no, you don't need 25K for marketing on a $50,000 movie. But if you've got a $10 million movie, indie movie, uh, I would, I would, I would, I, if I'm raising money and I can do it, I would want to set aside 25% because right. it gives me options, Right. I'm going to try to get maybe a premiere at Sundance or mm. Toronto or Tribeca uh, or Berlinale. And if I get a premiere there, I'm going to be putting effort and marketing publicity and promoting that at the premiere because I want a big acquisition from a big company or a studio. Uh, so you need some real money for that. And, and if you do that and you don't get a big sale, right, but then you still have a war chest, for for giving you options of how you want to get the film in the marketplace. Um, so so right. those distributors also market or they usually don't market your movie. That's the reason we had to 
put the 25%, 50% or certain amount of money for our marketing distribution? Well, it depends, right? I mean, if, 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 if um, Sony Pictures Classics picks up your movie, they're putting money into marketing. Uh, if, um, you know, Fox Searchlight, I don't even know what the hell they've been picking up lately, if anything, but, you know, if, if they pick up a film, they're putting a, a, a certain amount of marketing and publicity into pushing the film into the marketplace so people go to the theater to buy it, uh, to watch it. Um, so it really depends on the level, right? The, the studios and the major independents, Lionsgate, they're going to put money into marketing, right? If For anybody, you know, for those of you who scroll Twitter or Facebook, Instagram, you will see advertisements for movies every once in a while depends on where you are twitter well twitter's a mess so the um i think a lot of the advertisers for movies are have have paused their advertising on twitter that's what i'm noticing um facebook i don't see a lot of advertisements for movies on facebook but every once in a while i do and you know it's usually lionsgate that's got a teaser or a trailer and they're promoting a film so they're putting money into ever you know marketing their movies yeah, I so recently uh, saw something from Disney also. Disney be posting a lot of advertisement for TV. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but when you're talking about uh, many distributors, most independent distributors don't really do that much. They're, look, it's a, it's a different marketplace today than it was five or 10 years ago. So what they're willing to put into it, um, it really depends upon the launch point. The mm -hmm. launch point, that is the, the first place of exhibition, whether it's theaters or premium video on demand or you know one of the streamers like hulu or one of the premium cable companies like hbo you know if hbo buys licenses your film and and it's a premiere or something like that you know you're you don't you're not going to really need to put money into marketing yeah, if yeah. you want to so you know so let's say you made a 10 million dollar movie and you can't get the kind of sale you want but you end up making a deal with HBO for whatever, you know, a million, a couple million, whatever. Well, that two and a half million you had set aside could go back to the investors. Right, right. Or, All right. So Tyler, I have this question quickly. So do you know if you can get a D-list actor for $10,000 for a very low budget movie and is it worth it? Yes. The answer, short answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, I thought so too. Yeah. Uh, you know, D-list, you can probably get a C-list. Or you maybe, even, maybe in a B minus actor for Chris. probably not Bruce Willis, but like Ryan Felipe, he hasn't done anything at all, so he may be able to do it for five thousand dollars. Yeah, the savvy producers, you know, it's it's it, the savvy producers under who've been in the game for any period of time kind of know this, and so they'll hire whether it's <laughs> Michael Pare, you know, or Tom Sizemore. I mean, they they they're overused, but. At least it's still some. It's a face that the public recognizes. Um, I'm not promoting those two actors. I'm just saying those are examples of what a lot of producers will do. Um, you know, right. my, Michael Madsen's known for you know doing so much stuff, and and he's considered overused by a lot of people in the industry. But you know, so what? You know, uh, or, or choose somebody else on that level yeah. and pay them their four grand or five grand a day, whatever it is they want. And if it's a couple days, all right, it's eight, 10 grand. Uh, if it's done in LA or if it's done wherever they live, that makes it more palatable to them. If they have to travel, then you're mm -hmm. going to pay for the travel and the, and putting them up. Right. And, and some actors don't want to travel for two days work. So keep that in mind. Right. So we're going back about uh, big distribution company. You mentioned earlier HBO, Hulu, Netflix. Uh, a lot of independent filmmakers feel like if they can make the movie into Netflix, they made it. Is that, do they really make the money back from Netflix? Let's say you, you, or they, you know, because they, you no. can explain them better than I do. No. Yeah. But that's a good point, Johnny, is that, that, you know, you're not gonna, if you're making a $500,000 movie, don't expect to get a Netflix deal. That's going to cover your budget. Um, now, could it happen? Sure. But don't expect it. Um, Netflix doesn't pay huge license fees for independent movies. In fact, they don't really pick up that much in the way of independent movies because they're making 100 movies a year themselves, mm. you know, um, or whatever that number is now. But it, but it was about 100 movies a year they were making. So 
you know, they're in production for two movies every single week, or they have been. Um, you know, Netflix's business model is to create their own content, and it has been that way for a number of years now. So they don't need to pick up your little your little indie movie, you know. Or now, if you've got a movie that <laughs> has taken off um, and it's gotten a lot of notoriety, and it's an indie, yeah, they might be interested, but don't expect a big license fee. You know, I know license fees can range. Um, without naming the movie, I know that one particular movie um, was making is is got a licensed deal, I think, for about forty k, but it had a lot of notoriety to it. Mm. No real names in the cast. Uh, one name of of someone who's been around a long time, but he's not a big name, very small name. Um, and they got a licensed deal for forty k, and then they got yeah. a it got renewed for another, I think, forty k. That's pretty cool. You know, yeah. that's not bad, it, it, but that, but, but that's, but that's just that one, you know, then they had all these other things they could do with it and other places they could go with it domestically. Uh, yeah. So I think the Netflix deal was not either non-exclusive or exclusive for a very limited period of time, not the entire period. I also know that uh, some of the movies, for example, for one, some of my feature film has been submitted to Netflix many, many times. So every six months get submitted in because of hoping that based on the genre and the, uh, that uh, the the genre moment the the the, the moment that the Netflix is looking for is have a genre and if my genre fits into the movie they'll pick it up. That's right. Uh, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, if you've got a film that they don't have that that doesn't really um, that that fits a segment of their demographic that they don't feel is being served well enough, that is the reason why they might license your title. Yeah, yeah. Tyler got another question for you. I like it, Tyler. Thank you for asking all this question. You make it tough for him, which is good. Uh, does it matter if the known actor only plays a very small part, or it is preferred that the known actor play a larger part? Um, okay, that's a good question. Um, ultimately, it comes down to so. Here's why putting in some known act, some you know B minus C list actors makes a difference when you do that you have a wider range of distributors that you can pitch to and who will say we want to look at your movie we want to review it because they think they can make money with it so it gets the distributors attention and if they're only in one scene it's not you know a distributor's not going to go well the actor was only in one scene you know they, it's going to be whether they still think they can make money with the film or not um I, you know, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry. Um, hey, look, if you can get an actor, one of those, you know, an actor with some name le quality, and they're one of the leads or co-leads, great. That's even better. But if you've got an actor who's got two days of work for you and they're in three scenes, well, then so be it. They're in three scenes. You can still put their name on the poster, right? And you can still tell distributors so and so's in the movie, um, and that will get their attention. Because a lot of this game with distributors is you've got to get their attention and get them to think. Selling a movie is a psychological endeavor. I know that sounds weird. That sounds effed up. But, but it really is. It's a game of influence. And when you are, position your movie in a way that tells the distributor you have a good movie or a successful movie or a movie that will make them money, you, that gets their attention. Gets my attention. And and you know I mean it's just it that that's what goes through our heads is oh this is a good movie oh it must be a good movie you won an award at Sundance wow you know not many movies win awards at Sundance so you win at Sundance and you tell me Jerome I got this movie we won the audience award at Sundance you know what I want to see the movie I want to see it right now I might want to pick up this movie because if if we won an audience award the audience liked it. It won over all the 170 other movies. It must be good. That's what we think. It must be good. Uh, and if it's good, we can make money with it. Oh, it's really, a, you know, it's um, it really comes down to positioning and and influencing your audience. Uh, and, and by the way, let's say you don't want to use a distributor. Let's say you want to go a DIY route, a do-it-yourself route. Well, guess what? That same effort and same ethos applies to selling your public on buying or watching your movie, right? It's, 
It's why should Joe Blow in Nebraska spend 90 minutes watching your little indie movie that they don't know anything about when they can watch the latest superhero movie from the studios? Why should they? It's the same money, same amount of money, maybe. Why should they watch your movie? That's 90 minutes, man, or two hours um, or three ninety nine. Why? You got to give them a reason why. And so when you've got some even sea level talent, that is enough of a reason for a lot of people to give it a shot, uh, to click on it, to buy it, yeah, to yeah. whatever. Great answer. I got a question now since you talk about winning awards or festivals. <laughs> Um, I like to do it in person. The way I like to do things is I, when I have movie done, I go to the film festival and distribution at the same time. Some people do not like that. So some people want to go to the festival route first, getting a lot of attention and they hopefully get pick up. Otherwise, they then go to distribution. For your point of view, it, it's a good idea that winning all these different laurels or having different laurels or winning different awards would then impact or influence the movie to become more interested. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, and and I, I, I mean, this is, this is something that I ta I've taught for years about how film festivals can be a very, very valuable and important uh, piece of your movie, the journey with your movie. Um, now, some people like, well, I don't, want, I don't want to do film festival. I don't want to spend six months or a year doing this a lot of time. It costs me a lot of money. I don't want to do that. I just want to get in the marketplace. Well, you know, you've got a genre film. It depends on what your goal is as a filmmaker. Uh, if, if you've got a genre film, you know, you can potentially make money without having done film festivals. Um, but if you want, let's say, to get a deal with a major company that perhaps places a certain, um, you know, premium on on festivals or certain festivals, then if you're in the festivals, and especially if you win something, but if you're in the high profile festivals, that can mean something very, very meaningful to that particular company. So, um, so, and there are, I would say most distributors, I won't say 100%, but I would say the majority of distributors can be influenced by you having won awards, right? That means, and here's why. That means that your movie has been curated, curated by a number of festivals who chose your movie over all the other thousands of movies out there to, to screen it. And it tells us it must be an okay movie at the very least. It can't be a piece of shit. You know, if a movie's been in 20 festivals, 30 festivals, it's it's it probably won't be a piece of crap. Now, it may not be great, but it's probably not like the you know <laughs> the the thousands of other movies out there that really are not good at all they were made by a first timer maybe and they don't don't know how to make a movie i've seen a lot i have seen a lot of crap in the past 5 months i've seen good films too but i've seen films where the sound is horrible where the framing the the how how they shot the film is bad um uh you know they go from you know tiny head to you know like that i mean or whatever you know i mean it's it's like they don't know what they're doing. So, so when you are in a lot of film festivals, it gives you a certain, um, you know, again, a certain, well, it must not be horrible and maybe I can make money with this. So I want to see it. I want to see it now. You know, when I get submissions, um, by the way, if anybody out there, you know, you've got a movie and you want me to take a look at it, you can submit your movie via my website, which is, um, uh, actually, I'll, I'll post it up for you. Yeah, actually, it's lionheart.la. I, I know my email address is jerome at distribution.la, but my website for dis my company is lionheart.la. It's the phone number, too. I already have it. In oh, there. Okay. So, um, so you can submit your film via a link, <coughs> submit your film link at my website. So when I get a film in that has not been in any festivals, um, then, yeah, that's right. Uh, then I'm going to watch it. I'm going to review it. But if you, but if I see a film that's won a bunch of awards, uh, you know, I'm probably going to watch that one first, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, because I have a limited amount of time, and I get to everything eventually. But 
you know, if I've got uh, right now, I have five movies to, that are in my queue to watch, um, which actually isn't that many. But, you know, um, I, I when I when they come in, I try to do them sequentially. I try to review them sequentially. But if one comes in and like, whoa, I, I got to watch this one right now. I mean, this is what distributors do. I'm you know, this is what we do. I, you know, I, I want to watch this one right now. I'm going to watch this one right now in front of the others. So, right, right. You know, it, it, and also. Last thing I'll say about this, Johnny, is, you know, uh, there, there'll be jaded people in Hollywood who will say, oh, film festivals, they don't mean anything to the public. Well, you know, um, that's somewhat true and somewhat not true. You know, is Joe Blow in Nebraska again going to watch your movie because you won three awards at a film festival? They don't even know what film festivals are, a lot of people, right? So it may not help them, but it helps the gatekeepers. It helps those you want to you wanna impress to take on your film. Yeah, good point. So Andrew Chapman got this question for you. Okay. Do distributors care about films winning at smaller scale festivals to help pick up a film or just bigger festivals? Um I you know, that's a good question, Andrew. And I, I'm I'm you know, I can only I can't speak for everybody, but the way I view this is if a film has won festivals. Okay, th there are two or three basic levels of film festivals, right? We, there's the top tier, what we call the top tier film festivals, Sundance, Toronto, Cannes, Berlinale, Tribeca, um, you know, uh, South by Southwest, and, and a few others. Okay, so there's the top tier, and there's, you know, maybe there's 10 in the top tier worldwide. Then you have what we all tend to refer to as second tier festivals. Um, and this is no, no uh, disrespect intended, but second tier might be Seattle International, Chicago International. Um, you know, these festivals that are important and can really help your film, but they're not gonna be ones where you've got 20 acquisitions executives from the major studios and the big companies all there looking to pick up stuff, right? So we call those the second tier. Some people have a third tier, and that's those that are below a Seattle International or below a Cinequest or below a Mill Valley or below a Hamptons, right? And and those might in those the smaller the little film festivals, the Omaha, Nebraska Film Festival or whatever. I keep saying Nebraska, but you know, um, uh, you know the smaller film festivals that many people won't have heard of, perhaps. You know, when I get a film in and it's won a bunch of awards at these second tier and third tier festivals, that, that's meaningful to me. Again, it means that this film has gone through somewhat of a curation process, curation from many film festivals. So I don't expect it to be bad, right? I'm already predisposed to thinking it must be an okay or a good film. And that's part of the influence game, right? If you... Um, and this is just important, but it's a little, it's a little ethereal to people. But if you are, but this is why influencers are such a big thing, marketing, and advertising, it all works, right? You know, um, you can name the top five laundry detergents off the top of your head because you've grown up seeing commercials for them every day. So it's like when, 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 it, or, or it's when, you know, when someone calls, says, Hey, Jerome, someone I know, Jerome, I just saw this great movie. You should check it out. You know what? I'm like, okay, I have to check it out. Then a second friend says, Jerome, oh my God, you can't believe this. Everything, everywhere, all at once. That movie is tremendous. Well, now I've heard it a second time from someone I know. And now I probably really am going to see it because I trust the opinion of these people. So it's the same philosophy. Even though there's a lot of little film festivals that have programmed you or you've won awards, I have to assume it's not a bad movie. I have to assume it's decent. Are good and therefore I could probably make money with it right so that's where most distributors sorry for the long answer Johnny but that's where most distributors they, they most of them will think like that in some yeah. fashion yeah thank you thank you I mean we cover a lot of part of it but now let's part cover about your business your new distribution company what make you different from anybody else uh, all right. So what makes me different is that, um, is that a, I give a shit, um, sorry for my language, but you know, I'm, I'm very selective. 
very selective. I'm probably only picking up one movie out of 10 that I watch, that I review. Um, I'm not picking up everything the way some distributors do. There are some distributors, a lot of distributors out there that will pick up everything left and right. They throw it against the wall. Whatever happens, happens. And what they're doing is they're building their library. Because when you have a big library, the bigger the library goes, the more valuable the company is. And that's a business model. And that's fine. That, you know, companies have the right to do that. I don't think it's so fair to the filmmaker or the producer, but there are companies, and I won't name them, you know one of them, Johnny, that do that. They, they release 30, 35 movies a month. Most of them make no money. But they have a library that's worth millions and millions of dollars. That's not my business model. My business model is to pick up movies that I care about, that I like and care about, and that I think I can generate revenue with for the producer. Uh, so there's a certain amount of care or, or a lot more care that I give than a lot of distributors. That, that makes me different. My distribution fee is lower than most companies out there. Um, and my term is only two years. Presently, it's only two years, which is shorter than most companies. So, and my point of view is, look, when we start working together and the film goes in the market, you know, if after two years you're unhappy with me, I don't want you to be tied to me for a decade or a decade and a half. Right. I don't want you to feel like you're in Jerome's prison, right? You know, and a lot of companies, you know, you're signing seven, 10, 15 year deals. So if you hate them after a couple of years, you're stuck for another 10 years. Yeah. So I'm different in that regard. Now, do you do international or just domestic? No, they're good. Yeah, I just do domestic, US and Canada. International is a whole nother ball game. And by the way, a lot of companies want worldwide rights today. Yeah. And I have taught for, again, for 15 years, I'd say probably 98% of the time you don't want to do, do those deals. Okay. There's a couple companies that are good at both domestic and international <laughs> that are not the studios. I mean, if you're making a deal with the studio or Lionsgate or whoever, and they want worldwide, okay, you're probably, you know, they're going to get it out there. It's going to go everywhere and fine. You'll, you'll be okay. You'll be okay in terms of your film getting everywhere. Um, and there are a few independents that are good at that too. Most are not. Most distributors, if they pick up worldwide, what they're doing is if they're a domestic distributor, they are farming out the international rights to another company yep. and taking a piece of your revenue pie. So they become a middleman. Yes. And vice versa. If you're making a worldwide rights deal with an international sales company that sells their expertise is selling internationally, <laughs> Uh, they're just going to find a domestic distributor like me and say, hey, Jerome, we have this film. We have the rights. We want you to handle domestic. I'll be, I'll be like, yeah, sure. I'll, I mean, if I like the movie, sure, I'll take right, it. Right. And then they get a piece of that revenue pie. So, that's so we, Yeah, we got another three minutes, but then we'll, I have two questions here lined up. Uh, one is Andrew uh, follow up. So he wanted to know whether or not filmmakers should take more shots at submitting at the top festivals, even the submission fee could be steep. Um. I think it depends on the film, right? I mean, I think it really, it really depends on, um, you know, there are certain festivals that, that are appropriate for certain types of films. And then there are those film festivals that are kind of open to anything. And so, you know, Sundance has a very specific bent uh, in terms of what they're willing to program or not program by and large. Um, Tribeca does as well. Uh, Toronto, maybe I would say, in my opinion, Toronto's a little more open. You know, will they program a genre film? Yes. Um, it really depends on the film. So I wouldn't say do a scattershot approach, but you know, the, I, there are, and, and this is not something I do, but there are film festival strategists out there one could hire to help them determine what festivals should they apply to. Um, If I come on board of a film early enough, and there is a film right now that they've not signed the contract yet, but you know, if I if they bring me on board, they haven't started film festivals yet. So um, I believe it's a, it's a good film, and I believe it can generate revenue for everybody. And so if they bring me on, if they sign the deal and bring me on board, I'm going to be strategizing the festival game with them. So it really, you know, you really want to pick and choose. Excellent question. And finally, this is from uh, a person who claimed that to be my son, even I don't believe that is true. 
kidding. Uh, he wanted to know about the importance and basics of error in, in omissions insurance. Um, all right. Well, that's that could be. Uh, here's the basics, and then I'll sit, just uh, address the importance. The basics are errors in omissions insurance. Most indie films don't get this when they go into production. They only get it when the, when they need distribution. Um, and what it does is, it, that's what's called errors and omissions. And what it does is it protects you, the producer, <laughs> and the distributor from potential lawsuits over something about the movie. Whether it's a character's name in the movie, let's say you're using the name John Robbins, for your lead character who's a serial killer and you place in your movies takes place in Omaha, Nebraska, again, Nebraska. Uh, uh, and why in Nebraska? Yeah, I don't know. Just cause I like the name <laughs> Nebraska. Uh, <laughs> and, and there's an actual John Robbins who lives in Omaha, Nebraska. Now John Robbins could file a lawsuit against you and say, you've made a movie about him and it's false, right? So errors and omissions uh, helps protect you against lawsuits like that or copyright issues or whatnot. Now, when you apply for errors and omissions, you know, there's an application process. So the insurer is going to vet the, your application. And, you know, and so ideally when you're using someone's full name, for example, and you're setting it in a very specific locale, hopefully you, the filmmaker, looked up to see if anybody who lives in that locale when you make the movie actually has that full name. So, you know, a lot of films, they don't have full names. They're just first names uh, or the locale is not specific. Um, anyways, I, I could get in the weeds on that. So errors and omissions helps protect you and uh, covers you, covers you basically uh, with insurance. Now the important, so that's really the importance and the basics. Um, today, Many VOD platforms don't require, first of all, in the past, distributors always required it. Today, many distributors are not requiring it, but it's still a risk to you. Um, I'm not saying you have to do it. I don't tell filmmakers who, who make a deal with me, they have to have e and I only require it if we are going to an outlet that says we need E&O insurance. Mm. Um, you know, if you don't have it, someone could still sue you. But the truth is that most people aren't going to sue an indie filmmaker who probably doesn't have any money anyways, you know, or assets. If you've got an asset, if you own a house, you own property, yeah, you probably ought to get E&O because you don't want, God forbid something happens, someone decides to sue you and you don't have insurance and now your house or your property is at risk. So. Excellent point. I'm assuming most of the time documentary had to worry about that more than anything else, right? Oh, say that again. Documentary usually are the one that had to worry about that most, more than anybody. Oh, any genre films. Um, I don't. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure if they have to worry about it more because there is a certain amount of um, mm. uh, leeway that documentaries have um, in terms of what has gone through the court system over the past fifteen years, twenty years maybe, in terms of what you know what can be in a documentary that is considered kosher okay right. and right. you can't be sued over uh there was a very there was a landmark case and i forget the year a landmark case uh, uh litigated by a prominent uh entertainment attorney here in la and they went through the court system and they won and now it's pretty much considered settled law Thank you. Cool. So, you know, we are all basically at the end of this this uh, one hour conversation we have here. And uh, Jerome, do you have any final tip for independent filmmakers uh, if they want to go into the, you know, the only thing we didn't talk about is do do, do it yourself uh, distribution. But yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. So, you know, I, uh, so maybe I can say something about that. DIY distribution is very challenging. Uh, it's not easy, not for the faint of heart. Of course, movie making is not for the faint of heart. But, um, you know, if you're going to do a DIY approach, then, you know, just know it's going to cost you money or time or both. And it's a lot of work, you know, marketing. You know, if you're going to spend if you decide, hey, I, I just I want to do this myself. I, I don't need a distributor. Fine. Go for it. But 
you just know that you're going to you, that becomes your it has to become your full time job if you really want to have success with it. Um, because again, getting people to want to go to the theater or getting people to choose your movie over the other 50,000 options they have on Amazon or wherever, you know, how are you going to get them to know you exist? And how are you going to get them to know your movie is more important for them to watch than Squid Game that they've heard about for two years, right? So, you know, it really comes down to that. And, you know, and, and a lot of movies, you know, have a lot of advertising behind them. I mean, the big movies do. Um, so, you know, you've got to, you've got to, figure out how you're going to find your audience and then how you're going to sell them on giving 90 minutes of their time to you and three ninety nine dollars or, or whatever the price point is. Thank you. Thank you. So any final tips? And uh, we have Jerome's information in the bottom of the scrolling here. So feel free to reach out to him anytime you want to. But uh, uh, Jerome, give us some final tips or you want to give to uh, independent filmmakers. Um, final tips. Um, well, I, I think, you know, I think the big thing is be, be aware, you know, we talked about this before, you know, keep your budget as low as possible, if possible. Um, if you were at a higher level movie, a $2 million, $3 million movie, you know, heck, even if you're at a $300,000 level, you better have names in your cast. I, I, this, this happens a lot. Oh, I made this $500,000 movie. Who's in it? You know, you're already, you get asked that by distributors. Who's in it? nobody well known, nobody known. Why? Why would you spend a half a million dollars and not put a name, semi-name actor in the cast or several? You know, that is just, in my opinion, foolhardy. It's foolish. Um, you need to protect your upside. You need to protect, unless you, you know, getting donations and it's all donation based or the investors want to use it as a write-off so they don't care. Build in a, a, a film that will have a potential audience for it, even if it's a drama or a comedy or a coming of age. Do something. Create a project that has a potential audience for it um, and that you ideally know how you might reach that audience uh, and that you can then communicate that to a distributor or use it if you're taking a DIY approach. So, um all that said, um, you know, anybody has any questions, you can email me at my email address here. Uh, or if you've got a film, feel free to submit it to me at lionheart.la, uh, not .com, but .la. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, make movies, make good movies, and uh, good luck to everybody. Yeah, thank you everyone for watching this and thank you Jerome for being here with us. Um, maybe we should come back again another year then to, to do another follow up again to see yeah. how it's going. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you for no, the Thank time. you everyone. So I'll we'll see you guys next time. Thank you for watching. Jerome, stick around after the broadcast. Okay, sounds good. All right.